Hello everyone. The Gospels tell us that large crowds of people followed Jesus wherever he went. Some people followed him to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases and for other needs. But some others, such as the Pharisees and the Sadducees, followed him in order to find a way to entrap Jesus. They often asked many difficult questions to get him to incriminate himself by speaking against the Roman Empire or the Jewish people, their religion, customs and laws. When they failed in their attempts to expose Jesus, they joined other groups that opposed him, even their enemies. Jesus was the common enemy. Friends, last week we looked at how the Pharisees and the Herodians set aside the differences and came together in a joint effort to challenge and destroy Jesus. They asked him to pass judgment on the right of Jews to pay taxes to the Romans. But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, reproved them for their hypocrisy and advised them that they must render to Caesar the things that belong to Caesar, because his image and inscription were on the coins which they used. At the same time, he declared that they must render to God the things such as praise, honor, glory, worship, thanksgiving, love and justice which belong to God. Friends, today's gospel narrates yet another confrontation between Jesus and the Pharisees. This time, Matthew writes that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, the rivals of the Pharisees, but who got together with them. Friends, it is good to know what happened between Jesus and the Sadducees. What question did the Sadducees ask Jesus? Then what did Jesus say to silence them? Friends, the Sadducees were an aristocratic priestly class of Jews, influential in the temple and the Sanhedrin, and unlike the Pharisees, did not believe in angels, demons, the devil, the resurrection and the afterlife. After the Pharisees' failed attempt to trap Jesus with the tax issue, the Sadducees had approached Jesus and brought up a question involving the resurrection and marriage. They cited the story of a woman married to a man who later died without giving her any children. In accordance with the Mosaic law, her husband's brother would take her as his wife in order to perpetuate the dead brother's line. But he too died shortly thereafter without giving her any children. This happened in succession with the seven brothers. The Sadducees' question was, at the resurrection, of the seven brothers whose wife the woman will be, since all of them were married to her. Friends, the Sadducees implied that heaven was simply an extension of things on earth which human beings most enjoy, such as marital relationships. But the woman had seven husbands. How could her marital relationship be possible? Friends, here the Sadducees were just trying to make the resurrection appear ridiculous. Their problem arose because, according to Jesus, they did not know the scriptures or the power of God. Friends, this statement was a strong denunciation of religious leaders. Because of all the people, they certainly should have known the scriptures and God's power. Because, according to the scriptures, there is resurrection and God's power can bring people back to life. Therefore, Jesus pointed out to them that resurrection life or heaven is not simply an extension or continuation of earthly life. With the power of God, all relationships are changed and each of us are radically transformed in the resurrection. There is no exclusive relationship in heaven because everyone will be perfectly and intimately related to everyone else and to the living God himself. Friends, but when they heard this, they were astonished at his teaching and went away. Now, upon hearing this, the Pharisees gathered together again and hatched a plan based on a malicious desire. This time they sent one of their best lawyers or theologians to test Jesus. He questioned Jesus, Teacher, 
which is the greatest commandment in the law? Friends, it is generally assumed that the law here refers to the Torah in Hebrew, the five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy. But the word Torah can also be used to refer to the entire Jewish scriptures known to us as the Old Testament or to Jews as Jewish law and teachings. Friends, according to the Talmud, there are 613 commandments in the Torah, not to mention the hundreds of oral traditions that the Jews were expected to follow. So, certainly it was difficult for Jesus to select the undisputed greatest law. But Jesus, with no hesitation, quoted from the two books of the Torah and gave the two greatest commandments, one pertained to God and the other to human beings. First, making reference to chapter 6 verse 5 in the book of Deuteronomy, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. That is, the people are to love God with their whole being, emotionally, spiritually, intellectually and physically. Yet even though the lawyer had not asked for the second greatest commandment, Jesus quoted from the book of Leviticus, which said, You shall love your neighbor as yourself. That is, the people are to love their neighbors as truly and sincerely as they love themselves. In addition to identifying the greatest commandments, Jesus pointed out that these two commandments, to love God and neighbor, covered all the law and teachings of the prophets from beginning to the end. Friends, what is the message for us? 1. Israel's supreme duty was to love God and to show that love by keeping the law. But when they failed to live up to their obligations, Jesus reiterated what Moses had told the people by quoting the scriptures. Today, Jesus does not expect any less of us. Now, if I asked you, do you love God? Most of you would automatically say, yes, of course I do. If you do, then how do you express your love for God? You might say, well, I display my love for God by attending religious activities such as Holy Mass, prayers, sacraments, ceremonies, Bible reading and carrying out charitable works. But the question is, is it possible to do all these things without love for God? Yes, it is possible. Many atheists are so well versed in the Bible but hate God. Some believers diligently observe all rituals but have no fear of God. Some believe in God but know God's law or the Bible. That's why Jesus says that we must love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our mind. In essence, we are to love God with our whole being, with a sincerity, feeling, dedication, obedience and trust. Friends. To love someone truly means that we also know the person well and love everything about the person. The same is true with our love for God. So if we say we love God, then first we must know God and love His word as aptly expressed in Psalm 119 which says, Oh, how I love your law. Second, we must worship and praise Him. Third, we must put Him above all else. Fourth, we must desire Him and earn for His righteousness and His grace. Finally, we must obey His commandments. 2. In His second commandment of loving our neighbors as ourselves, Jesus has showed how the first greatest commandment can be made practical. Here, we do not need to learn to love ourselves because that comes naturally at least for most. But to love others means we must care for not just for our friends, allies and families, but for all persons from everywhere, as we do care for our own body, mind and soul, and to love them as Christ loves us. 3. 
when we truly love God by worshiping him faithfully and keeping all of his commandments diligently and love our neighbors as truly and sincerely as we love ourselves we fulfill all the laws and teachings of the prophets and we are certainly on the road that leads to eternal happiness joy peace and everlasting life amen god bless you